So I'll just uh, uh, take a minute to introduce myself. My name's Sarah Bradley. I'm a professor of law here uh, at the Schulich School of Law. Um, I teach uh, mainly in the business law area. I teach corporations law, amongst a few other businessy sort of things. Um, my full profile is on the uh, on the uh, law school website. So if you have any further interest in finding out who I am, I'll, I'll leave it to your uh, own resources to sort of check me out. But um, I'm going to be talking today about uh, the role of corporations in society. Uh, sort of a fairly broad uh, topic, um, one though that I think is of you know, sort of general interest to sort of uh, general to people uh, uh, from coming at the, the question from a variety of, of uh, perspectives. So this logo you might recognize is from uh, the uh, book and uh, subsequent movie uh, of the same name called The Corporation, written by a, uh, an alumnus of this, uh, of this school and it's quite an interesting read. Um, what I'm going to be talking about today, I've sort of broken it down into four sort of subtopics. Um, the first is you know, the, the role of the corporation in popular culture. And I think a lot of us would be familiar with this characterization of the corporation. It's certainly the one uh, advanced by, uh, by Joel Balkin in, in the book and movie The Corporation. This idea that the corporation is somehow a corrupting or evil influence uh, and that, uh, and, and Joel Balkin's, I think, central idea was around this idea of if the corporation was a person, it would be uh, a psychopathic person, and how do we feel about that, and, and, and whether that's an appropriate, appropriate perspective uh, or an appropriate um, way of characterizing it, and, and, and how our regulations and the way we think about a corporation should be informed by that, by that reality. The second way I'd like to, to talk to you about or discuss the corporation with you today is um, viewing the corporation through an obviously quite different lens, which is looking at the corporation as an agent of uh, economic growth okay? uh, and as a really a unique sort of an instrument for the advancement of human prosperity. Uh, thirdly, um, looking at the corporation, and this sort of relates back to the first uh, characterization, but the corporation as sort of the, the scapegoat, if for want of a better word, or certainly um, a, uh, a focus of criticism um, for uh, the, uh, the really the, the, the more general problems of human greed and, uh, and capitalist market failures. And then finally, and I think I'll focus probably uh, maybe a little bit more of my remarks on this section, uh, what the, we as lawyers uh, think of when we're thinking about the corporation, and that is that the corporation is really a legal relationship between uh, many different uh, uh, individuals. Uh, and, and when we think about it in that sense, we can probably get a little bit better informed idea of, um, of who is actually directing the behavior of corporations what is likely to influence um, the behavior of corporations, and you know what these people are motivated by, what they are uh, influenced by, and what their responsibilities are. You know, and this can, this really can all feed back into you know the problems you know that are that that as I'm sure we're all aware have been identified with with how corporations conduct themselves. Okay, so first. Um, the corporation in uh, popular culture. I think, I think we can all agree that there's been uh, a growing awareness, a growing sort of social analysis of uh, the activities of corporations in society. Um, and although we think of this as kind of a, a, like a new thing, it's a, it's a uh, that was really nice. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it, we think of this as sort of a, an element of modern discourse. Actually, people have been debating what the appropriate uh, role of corporations is, what the, what, the, what the factual role of corporations is in society, and what it really should be, and how it should be influenced um, for, for literally uh, many, many decades, really since the beginning, uh, since the invention of corporations. Um, and. This, when we think about it in the modern context, we certainly would think of it as um, the corporate social responsibility movement. You know, this idea that we'll, 
will, uh, will sort of uh, want to examine, both locally and globally, um, you know, the true consequences of, of corporate behavior. Um, so, one of the things that we're trying to, that I think we as a society, when we think about corporate social responsibility and corporate social responsibility movement, is to look at some of the intrinsic uh, problems or sort of moral hazards that are inherent in the systems that we've created uh, around corporations. Um, we look at, you know, what are the motivations of those who control corporations, you know, these, these very powerful uh, economic and social actors. Um, but, you know, when we look at, I would suggest, a lot of this social discourse, it really often doesn't demonstrate um, a, a, an awareness of the true nature of the corporation. You know, we hear a lot of sort of off-the-cuff remarks about, uh, you know, well, big corporations are really the problem here, and there's not, there's not a lot of awareness of, you know, what the corporation really is, how the corporation has come to be so ubiquitous in our, in our world, um, and, you know, the, the role in society that they really do play. So that's, that's partly why I wanted to sort of address this as, as one of the sort of themes of, of, uh, of this talk. And we also have a tendency to anthropomorphize the corporation. You know, we tend as a society to think of them as big, uh, amorphous people. Um, they are, uh, uh, you know, viewed in, in this way. I don't know if that, that animation came out very well, but they have, you know, uh, uh, human-like uh, emotions um, and other characteristics. So we would think of them as, for example, greedy or, um, or amoral or of, of have, to have some particular kind of moral characteristic or to, to, to have some sort of psychosis, for example. I mean, these are, these are human characteristics, but there's something about thinking about the corporation that leads us to, um, to kind of imagine that they have these characteristics. You know, we look at what corporations do and we think, well, if that were a person, you know, it would be a person with these, with these characteristics. But of course, if we stop and think about it, we realize that a corporation doesn't have a, a corporeal body. You know, it doesn't have a brain for the per and, and it can't have these emotions or these sort of moral positions that we would normally think of if we were, if, you know, if we are thinking about, uh, about a person. But we actually, for a lot of us, don't have an, another framework for understanding. Um, so, so that's partly uh, why we'll, I'll be sort of looking at this today. And, and there, we also have, I think, in general, most of us have kind of a lack of understanding of the machinations of the gigantic global businesses that exist in the world around us. Um, when, these, when these realities are laid bare, um, they can really be, be shocking to us um, and, and be shocking and upsetting to our sort of idealized understanding of the way the world works. Okay? This illustration is from Food, Inc., a shocking book, if ever um, there was one highlighting sort of how the, um, how the, the global food markets work. Um, you know, and so when we look at these kind of, uh, these kind of where we're confronted with these kind of realities and we're shocked, uh, it's easy to um, look for a cause, right? To lay blame. And uh, often we do that by, by looking at the actors who, who play a role in this. And of course, corporations are very, uh, play a very substantial role. Um, excuse me while I, okay. Um, and, very often we're motivated to do this, right? Because we're looking, we're seeking to try to identify a meaningful mechanism for change, right? So, so when we look at um, systems of business that we are uncomfortable with, we look at you know who is who is actually uh, involved in these businesses, and of course corporations usually play a very large role, and we identify that as the problem, and and also perhaps the potential 
uh, avenue of solution. Um, and it's easy to uh, view corporations through, uh, through the lens of uh, the systems that they represent. Right? Uh, they are, uh, they're very large, they're very powerful organizations, um, they're very influential, although the exact paths of influence are sometimes uh, obscure. Um, we know that corporations are able to mobilize very vast resources, uh, and uh, and they'll mobilize, and they don't hesitate to mobilize their resources to achieve whatever their objectives are, and uh, further their own interests. And and you know, are we really sure about what it is uh, that they're doing and what their true motivations are? Um, we tend to have a uh, 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 we tend to hear claims like. We're really green, you know? We recycle. And if you've read the book Soylent Green, you would uh, appreciate that the Soylent Corporation really was not very green, really did not, or they really did recycle, but in a very disturbing and upsetting way. Um, and so we kind of look at the corporations as being these faceless, you know, soulless, uh, uh, you know, objects uh, of our discontent, right? They're, um, in the popular imagination, it's very easy to, to, to view them as evil or as corrupt, right? As psychopathic. And then sometimes we just love to hate them, right? Um, there's, but there's, there's no denying that uh, corporations really do um, play a, an important and influential role in a lot of the deficiencies and problems that that we quite rightfully associate with the capitalist system of economic regulation and um, and I'll be discussing that a little bit more uh, a little later um, and this role has been highlighted recently by the CSR movement or the corporate social responsibility movement but it's but it's 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 not new um, and there's been, it's worth noting that you know, the, one, of the, one of the upshots of the corporate social responsibility movement has been um, really an increasing trend towards uh, uh, greater political awareness of the role of corporations, greater political willingness to change laws uh, or to uh, create new laws uh, that are aimed at regulating corporate behavior. Okay? Um, and some of these laws are directed specifically at corporations, so they might be laws relating to the duties of directors of a corporation, for example, or they may be more broadly based laws, laws relating to you know environmental pollution and so on that that you know would affect would regulate any actor regardless of of whether they're a corporation or not um, and I think this responsiveness is important to observe, right? Uh, you know, the legal systems, you know, in order to remain uh, relevant, uh, legal standards have to be updated to reflect modern sensibilities. Uh, as we're probably very well aware, they're not necessarily going to be updated um, uh, with exact precision, you know, to, to match precise uh, uh, trends in, in public expectation, but but in general, um, for a system of laws to be accepted, it needs to be uh, to be responsive to the general um, the general understanding of society. Uh, and also, uh, laws need to be updated as well to reflect modern business practices. And those, of course, change over time. So, <clears throat> I'm going to spend some fairly you know significant time talking to you about the nitty gritty of what corporations are and how they operate. Um, but for the moment, I'd like to, to take a step back and, dis and discuss kind of the important role that they play uh, in our society uh, and in our world. So I'm going to put forward the idea that the corporation is actually um, one of humanity's most important inventions ever. So yes, more than the printing press, more important than the invention of vaccines, you know, I will say that the corporation is the most important human invention. 
Some of you may not agree with that characterization, but let me make the case okay, for why I, I, I think that might be true. Um, there's an absolutely positive correlation between, um, between human health and human income, uh, between human health and, and income per capita. It's really one of the best known relationships um, in international development. Okay? So we know that human life expectancy, uh, general uh, measures of human health, child mortality, uh, and subjective reports of well-being, you know, are all all improved, you know, uh, on, in an almost linear relationship with with uh, with income per capita. Okay, so economic development has profound impacts on human well-being, and this reality uh, is a very powerful driver of political choice. Okay, so when governments are deciding uh, about you know, social policy, when they're deciding about uh, business policy, when they're deciding about the enactment of laws and so on and uh, treaties and all of that sort of thing, this reality, whether we're talking about, you know, whether we're talking about a modern developed country or whether we're talking about a, uh, a developing country, um, you know, whether we're talking about a full-on capitalist society or a socialist society or, uh, or any, uh, anything in between or, or different than that, this reality is a really critical, um, a really critical uh, and influential um, one for, for decision makers and lawmakers. So, and so we have this underlying theme in business law. And the underlying theme is that Business entrepreneurship is good, okay? Investment is desirable, and these are things that should be encouraged. Okay? And that is really, that sort of policy is not independent, right? It doesn't exist outside of, you know, the reality that I've just discussed about, you know, how, how employment and, and income and so on are, are, are strongly correlated with, with with human prosperity, um, and, but this is a, this. There's another fundamental um, fundamental assumption here that we make as a society, and that is that the wealth that is generated, uh, whether it's generated by corporations or by anyone anyone else in society, uh, can be and is redistributed in accordance with political preference. Okay, so the basic idea is that. Uh, if the society you know, uh, generates a greater uh, amount of wealth that we can, and principally this is done through the process of taxation, we can uh, tax or take away money from one person or one group of people in society and we can give it to others okay? in accordance with whatever we think is the appropriate uh, mode of doing that. We can use that system to, uh, to encourage certain behaviors. We can use it to discourage other behaviors. And, and certainly, that's what, that's what governments around the world actually do. Okay? So now, there are certainly, uh, it's very easy to uh, identify flaws with this assumption or flaws with this, the way this, uh, this system of redistribution actually works. Okay? Um, we just don't have the time today to really get into that. Uh, but obviously, it's 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 something that that is um, or can be identified as as a problem. Okay. But in general, all societies do this. Okay. In general, all societies tax some people and and redistribute wealth to to some others. Um, and that's that's an important component in understanding why you know allowing uh, for economic activity in general, or for some people in society, is generally considered to be good um, for the society as a whole. So why were corporations invented? Uh, you know, I think we need to just take a step back to look at where they came from. They're not necessarily that old. You know, uh, human culture and society certainly predates the invention of the corporation. Uh, they were um, the very, very earliest corporations uh, existed um, for the purpose of facilitating things like municipalities, uh, things like churches, you know. These were entities that were not human people, 
but that had some characteristics of a human person that they could own property, um, that they had an indefinite life, you know. Things like a, a church or, or, or a, go a government uh, edifice like a, like a uh, municipality um, really had a need for those types of incidents of personality. And so they were amongst the very earliest. And that the earliest of those type of uh, legally recognized entities is, very, is quite old, you know, probably uh, at least a thousand or more years old. In the more modern context, and thinking of it from a business perspective, you know, the very earliest corporations existed sort of, you know, in the early 1600s. They were created usually by the crown. Uh, they were um, created usually uh, for, um, for some specific uh, purpose, some very important social purpose, enough, important enough to attract the attention of the king or queen at the time. Um, later on, they became available through governments, so, but it still had to be an important enough purpose to attract the attention of the, the parliament. Um, but, uh, but we're generally talking about an invention of the last you know, 400 years. Okay? The modern corporation that we really think of today really came into, uh, into existence or, uh, in sort of the mid-1800s. Okay? That's the kind of corporation where a group of people could get together with a business idea and reasonably expect to be able to incorporate a company. You know, prior to that, it was all special favors, and there were very, very few corporations. And so, um, and the reason that corporations were invented and were and flourished the way they did is because they're necessary. And I'll get into why this is. They're necessary to allow for large accumulations of capital, large accumulations of money. Okay. Uh, for to, to, to undertake major infrastructure projects. Okay? Um, so the earliest corporations existed for the purpose of doing things like building railways, okay? building bridges, factories, roads, etc. Okay? All things that ha were deemed to have an important social purpose, whether it was because you know, the bridge was just necessary for the community, um, of course these were toll bridges, um, or whether it was because you know, the factories, the railways, and so on were deemed to be good for economic development. So think for a second about, you know, pre-corporation, right? How would one go about building a railway? You know, something phenomenally expensive. Okay, we're talking about, in modern terms, you know, billions of dollars. Okay? You have an idea, you know, this, the steam locomotive has been invented, right? Someone has come up with the idea of you know, send, shuttling it down steel tracks with this incredible power to transport a lot of machine, a lot of weight of goods and so on. Great idea. Somebody's got this idea. But only a few people actually have the engineering expertise to actually build a railway. Okay? Um, only a few people would know how to actually run the business side of a railway, how to price, how, to char how much you would have to charge a customer, for example, how you would market that, what the usefulness of it would actually be, and, and who would use it, and how much they would pay. Uh, only a few people are going to understand how to, how to run the business, how to operate its services, maintain its operations. And the important thing is that all those people whose expertise would actually be necessary right, for the building of the railway, probably none of them are billionaires. Right? So probably none of them have got the billions and billions of dollars that it would take to actually put this together. So, so there you've got a disconnect, right? What corporations are is a way, that is, that, uh, is a way for individuals who have some money, maybe not billions, who have some money to invest in these great ideas that other people have. Okay? and in the expertise that other people have in terms of, um, uh, in terms of uh, doing major projects. Okay? Before the corporation, you, know, you really had this problem of the money and the expertise were not generally in the same hands. And even if somebody did have a billion dollars and wanted to build a railway, would they really want it, would it be wise for them to really invest all of their money in this speculative venture. Right? So without, without this mechanism, without this, uh, this ability to use the corporate form, and, and you know, we'll get into some of the, some of the details about, about how it works and why it, it works for this purpose. But without that, 
big things would not happen, right? Highway systems would not be built. Railways would not be built, right? Large factories that could produce lots and lots of goods uh, in a short period of time would not be built, right? Because, because of these practical problems, right? So, so what the world needed, you know, what the, the, the Anglo-Saxon world needed anyway at this point we're, that we're talking about, was a safe and efficient way for people to invest their money in the undertakings of others. Okay. So, and, and for the purpose of allowing these things to happen in the first place. It allows for specialization. Okay. So people who are good at running a business or knowledgeable about engineering or whatever it may be can do that, whatever they are good at. And then the people who are wealthy, uh, have savings, uh, and are good at, at that can come together right, and specialize. Right? And another reality is that because of the issue of diversification that I just alluded to, when you're going to do a project that requires billions of dollars, it's very unlikely you're going to source that money from one person, all right, one investor. Because even if you could find the person who has that much money, they're not going to be inclined to risk everything on your one venture. Right? You're much more likely to be able to raise your billion dollars by getting you know, much smaller amounts of money from a much larger number of people. Okay. And that's, of course, how corporations work and how, how they, they work today. So this is really a way of bringing together large sums of money from large groups of people and putting it in the hands of specialized managers, people who have the knowledge and expertise to actually have the best, give the best chance of success to these good ideas and these undertakings. All of this happened around, as I said, the mid-1800s. This was the era of the Industrial Revolution. Okay? So the Industrial Revolution had a few, influenced this development in a few ways. Obviously, with the development of the steam engine and large machinery for mass production of, of goods, um, so there was a need for investment. Okay? There was a need for the, 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 the building of these factories and these railroads and so on. But the other development, uh, during the Industrial Revolution was the creation of a new merchant class, right? The middle class person, right? The person who was able to have a business just selling the things manufactured by others, right? Before that time, you really did have the wealthy classes and the, and the peasant classes and not a lot in between. Um, but now the new merchant class was evolving and was, had money. You know, they had maybe not tons of money, but some money. And they were entrepreneurial enough that they didn't want to just stick their money under their mattress, right? They wanted to have a place to invest it. You know, they're busy running their own business, but they wanted to be able to do something with their money that could grow without their immediate attention. Okay. So, so these were the principal uh, needs that were kind of new during the Industrial Revolution. And they haven't changed today. We still need, in order for, uh, to, uh, to, for our society to function, we still need to accumulate massive amounts of capital right, to, to be able to establish any uh, infrastructure product or, any, or infra infrastructure project, I should say, or any large scale uh, enterprise requires a lot of money. Um, and people still need to invest their savings. Right? So, so you have both, the, de you know, the demand is on both sides of the equation. We need, uh, we need to be able to invest our money in, in something, uh, so there's demand for that investment product, and there are others who want to do stuff and need money to do it. Okay? So, so we have the same system basically uh, operates today. So there are other forms of business organization, of course. Um, the one that, that, that predates them all is sort of the sole proprietorship, where one person goes out and and uh, using their own wealth and their own resources and their own expertise, starts a business, runs it, grows it, and so on. Uh, and then there's the situation of a partnership where multiple people um, combine their talents, combine their money, and, uh, and, and run a business. Those are the, 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 principal, the principal alternatives. But the key, that a cor the key to uh, you know, a corporation is that it allows for passive investment. Right? If you're a sole proprietor or you're a partner in a partnership, you are uh, 
working in that, in that business, right? You're presumed to be contributing a lot of your time to it. And you're motivated to do that because you are completely liable for anything that goes wrong with that business. So if the business enters into contracts and, uh, and fails, to, uh, fails to pay on those contracts, the individuals who are running the business you know, are the ones who have actually signed the contracts. They're the ones who are actually liable. It's a huge disincentive to uh, passive investment. Right? If you're going to invest in a partnership, typically, you're going to want to know what's going on with that partnership because your house, your investment savings, and everything are on the line. So limited liability is really a critical component of what it means to have a corporation and be able to actually attract the little sums of money from all of the different investors that are really required if you're going to accumulate large sums of capital. Another uh, key benefit that I've already mentioned is this idea of specialization. So you've got uh, the most skilled people running businesses rather than the wealthiest. Okay? And the reality is that there is no viable alternative in the world today okay, to, uh, that offers these benefits. Uh, so there is no real, um, no real sort of alternative. We can, we can demonize the corporation all we want, uh, but, but all of these benefits would be lost uh, without it. And that's not really a, a, a realistic um, possibility. So I'll just say a couple of words about uh, the corporation as a scapegoat. Um, there's no question that, um, that corporations are inextricably interrelated with the capitalist system. Okay? Um, and, uh, and corporations so are, are, are identified with the capitalist system, and, and, and probably rightly so. Um, and it also you know, is not really very controversial to observe that there's a lot of problems uh, that have been associated with the capitalist system. Um, despite the general benefit of economic growth that I've already mentioned in terms of its you know, correlation with human uh, prosperity, there's a lot of m what it, we could describe as market failures. You know, capitalism is based on markets, and there's a number of things that don't, um, don't uh, uh, get accounted for in these markets, and, and they're considered to be failures because it has a result that is undesirable um, to, to most of us uh, or a result that violates our, our ethical understanding of social behavior. Okay? So, you know, these are natural consequences um, that arise when corporations are going about their business, um, pursuing their, their, their interests, uh, and they're just not properly accounted for. So an economist would say they're externalities, you know, that are that just don't somehow get um, that get incorporated. And they're they're flaws that um, that cause corporations to either engage in or to exacerbate uh, certain things. So you've got labor market issues, right? In a in a sort of unregulated market, you'll have problems of a corporation or any business, not necessarily a corporation, of course. Uh, using its economic leverage to extract excessive work hours from its workers, for example, or to, um, to hire child labor, okay, to cr allow an unsafe uh, workplace to exist, to uh, pay insufficient wages, depending on what their leverage actually is, or to, to, to ignore um, socially desirable things like pensions, for example. You know, all of those things are, are, could, be, could be identified as a, as a, as a labor market failure. Now, other obvious examples would include environmental degradation. Okay, so pollution of air and water, a huge, a huge externality, uh, easily identifiable um, and, uh, and, and, and amply identified, I think, in the modern world. Lots of examples of where um, corporations just don't have the motivation to, um, to take care uh, of uh, not to degrade the environment. Um, similarly, uh, sort of poor resource stewardship, um, where you know uh, today's benefit is is uh, valued more than some future resource extraction. 
Um, consumer protection is another huge area of capitalist market failure uh, where unsafe products are sold, for example, damaging poisonous products. Um, corporations are also renowned for their anti-democratic activities, mostly in, uh, in other countries, but also in, uh, in, in this country in terms of uh, being very uh, willing to participate in things like bribery or uh, aiding governments in oppressive uh, activities, um, pro engaging in private military activity, all this sort of thing. You know, businesses tend to prefer stability. You know, and they're relatively agnostic about the source of that stability. You know, if it's, if it's, uh, if it's, if it's uh, uh, generated through a sort of respect for the rule of law, that's fine. If it's generated through, you know, oppressive uh, dictatorship, also fine as long as it's stable, right? So, so these are these are all problems um, that uh, that that can be can be identified, and and they violate our ideas about what is right. You know what is what is socially desirable, and so in that sense, they're a failure. Okay. Um, you know, and they can also offend some of our notions about distributive justice. You know, this basic idea that those who sacrifice, you know, or who contribute, should participate in the benefit that accrues. Okay. So that's sort of a. Um, I think these are things that we sort of, even globally, can have sort of a broad consensus uh, about um, about you know, what is undesirable about these, these failures. It's, it's, and I, but, I, but the, the heading is the corporation as scapegoat, and, and that's because these failures are not new, right? They are, they have been in existence uh, since um, the beginning of, you know, modern economies, okay? All of these market failures have, have, have been identified many, many centuries ago, and of course they're not unique to corporations either. Um, individual business owners have the same tendency to engage in the, all of these same, um, these same destructive uh, uh, and undesirable activities. It's really a natural consequence of capitalism, or sort of the pursuit of profit generally. Um, and as a society generally, you know, as, and I'm thinking, using society very broadly here, uh, we have become actually quite good at regulating. Uh, these uh, these activities, certainly in comparison to where we were at a hundred years ago, you know, um, all of these major uh, major problems have been. There's at least been a very strong concerted effort to to regulate in all these areas to sort of rather than um, rather than trying to sort of tackle this from uh, from the outset by changing, say, the nature of capitalism. The focus has really been on uh, on preventing the harm that is actually caused by just prohibiting it or, or uh, in, in instituting penalties and so on. Um, and so we've really seen, uh, we've seen a lot of effort put into like, numerous, uh, numerous reforms around, around all of these areas. And so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about the effectiveness of these, of these reforms and so on, but before I just want to have, say a little bit about the nature of the corporation. So the corporations are what we would say creatures of statute, okay? They don't exist except that some legal documents say they exist, right? So the parliament has passed laws that say, you know, in these circumstances, the, a corporation will exist. You know? That's where they come from. They don't have any sort of uh, other other existence. So they really are a creature of the statute. All of their powers that they have derives comes specifically from the statute under which they're incorporated. And one of the key features that uh, that these statutes provide for is this idea that the corporation is a separate legal entity. So here you've got all these separate little shareholders and investors. They're over here. Each of these is a person. You know. And then over here you've got the corporation, another person, right? A separate legal entity. And what you have is money being transferred from the investors over to the corporation. And what the corporation gives the investors back is shares in itself, and these shares represent rights, okay? The, what the rights that are transferred are the right to elect the directors of the corporation, the right to receive dividends in the corporation, and the right to receive 
the assets of the corporation or a proportionate share of the assets of the corporation when, when and if it ceases to exist. Shareholders are not liable for the debts and obligations of the corporation or any of its employees. Shareholders are not owners of the corporation. This is when you hear, it's a, you hear a lot, and it's, it's easy to sort of, sort of um, make this analogy because shareholders have such a strong economic interest in the corporation and what the corporation owns. It's easy to imagine that they own the corporation, but as a separate legal person, nobody owns the corporation. The corporation is a separate person, and of course, people don't own people. Um, so, so it's not really correct at law to say that, that a shareholder owns a corporation. And what they're definitely not is owners of the corporation's property. Okay, so the corporation owns its own property, and the shareholders own shares in the corporation. So here's your typical structure. Here you've got all the shareholders. These are in one box, but of course, they're all individual people. Their main right, aside from their economic rights, is to elect another group of people, a much smaller group of people, usually, and that's the board of directors. Okay? The board of directors' role is to appoint and oversee the managers of the corporation. So this would be the CEO, the whoever is actually the, ma the main employees of the company. So your officers, your your CEO, CFO, et cetera. Those people would all be specifically appointed by the board of directors and they report to the board of directors. These people may, depending on the size of the business or, or what's going on in the corporation, they might hire and oversee the activities of all the other employees of the corporation. Okay? And then over here, not connected to that chain of sort of power, are other stakeholders. And I'm not standing close enough to the mic, am I already? Okay, <laughs> I promise not to walk too far away from it. So you've got the other stakeholders. These are the employees of the corporation who are not managers. They are the creditors of the, of the corporation, those who've lent, lent money to it. Uh, the community in which the corporation exists, the country in which it exists, the other third parties. Right? Those, those sort of other stakeholders are not... Uh, although they're very strongly influenced uh, by what the corporation does, they're not uh, actually linked into its internal power structure. So shareholders, um, who are they? In the real world, in the modern society, 70% of shares of, of publicly traded companies anyway are owned by institutional investors. Okay? So your typical company that's a public company or that is listed on a stock exchange um, they are mostly owned by pension funds, mutual funds, uh, and other institutional investors. Okay. They have the power to elect the directors. Okay. And they, one sort of might think that they have a super, in the, in the sense that they are the electors of the directors, I think that they at least have a, some sort of supervisory capacity. But in fact, the supervisory capacity is often not really uh, exercised. Um, in widely held corporations, there's the problem of disaggregation, you know, where uh, most people uh, who are shareholders are not that interested in, in sort of getting involved in how the corporation is actually run. They're much more interested in how the share valuation is performing and uh, how much the company is making. And if the company is not living up to whatever benchmarks they, they would like to see, uh, they have a tendency to just sell their shares, okay? Maybe sell them at a lower price than they otherwise would because they're not happy. But they tend not to involve themselves in, in, in what's actually going on inside the corporation. Um, and this is a rational response, right? Because they only own, you know, 0.003% of the, of the shares of the company. So why should they go out and lobby hard to, to, for the, to make sure that the directors and the managers are doing a better job you know, so that everybody else would benefit, you know, more so than them? They're only going to get, if they do manage to get some, uh, some, some uh, meaningful change that re results in a better evaluation for the company, they're only going to experience, they're only going to benefit from a very small amount of it. And also, they probably, if they're like most investors, they probably have little holdings of shares in zillions of different corporations. Okay, so it's not a good investment of their time to figure out what's going on inside these corporations and get involved. That has changed a little bit with the increasing trend towards uh, institutional investor involvement. 
Now, when you hear talk about shareholders being activists or getting involved in the running of the corporation or trying to lobby for change, it's usually an institutional investor. Okay? That, and, and they've been more willing in recent years to get, to get involved, although it's still, it's still not a, a very effective, necessarily, means of overseeing what the board of directors does. The motivation of the shareholders almost always is profit. Okay? So um, there may be some exceptions. I'm sure we can think of you know, certain exceptions. There are some ethical funds, for example. Um, there are some institutional investors that are motivated specifically by certain uh, ideological um, perspectives. So for example, the California Public Employees uh, 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 Retirement Fund, CalPERS, uh, is a huge in institutional investor, one of the biggest institutional investors in North America. Uh, it has a specifically pro-union position. Okay, so it will use its power and influence to um, to try to get the boards of directors to um, to respect uh, the unions and their employment. So not even if that costs money. So there are some exceptions to the to the profit motive, but they're the exception rather than the rule. And then we're down to the next sort of level of authority within the corporation, and that's the directors. The directors are um, generally uh, employed on a part-time basis by the corporation. A typical schedule would be for uh, directors to meet uh, four times a year. Okay. In some corporations, some very large corporations, directors will meet somewhat more often than that. Uh, even in the very largest, most complex organizations, they would not meet more than once a month. Okay, so 12 meetings a year. Um, and they tend to be uh, experts, uh, influential uh, people who are, are b experts in running of a business or in some aspect of running of a business. They are generally uh, very uh, uh, um, well-regarded uh, people in their industry. And they're, they're chosen to uh, be a director because of their success in some other business. And uh, they're chosen for their business expertise. The directors are expected to do basically two things. They're expected to make sure that the managers are doing what they're supposed to do. So in that sense, they have a supervisory uh, role to play to make sure you know if the managers are um, misappropriating large sums of money or doing something that is uh, deemed to be sort of wrong or inappropriate. Uh, the question will all come to the directors like, well, why didn't you know this? You know, you had the supervisory uh, role. Now, given that they meet four times a year uh, and, and to hear presentations by the senior managers, this is not necessarily a very high standard to which they're, they're held. Um, but it is one of their, their key roles. They're expected to have systems in place for ensuring that, you know, really egregious uh, things are not going on in the corporation. And they're also expected to have an advisory role. Right? And this is where their business expertise comes in. Right? The, uh, they are expected to uh, create and promote uh, and decide on the major, um, major um, strategic goals of the organization. Okay? So they decide what major uh, uh, path the corporation is going to go on, they, and they delegate to the managers um, the actual carrying out of that strategy. Um, so as I mentioned, their supervisory capacity is sort of limited by practical uh, realities, by their, their, their relatively small time commitment and their, um, the, influence, the strong influence that managers have over the, over the information that directors receive. What they're motivated by, typically, is uh, not money. Okay. Directors, in general, are, tend to be quite wealthy uh, individuals to begin with. They tend to be uh, uh, quite successful, um, although they are paid usually you know, ten, twenty, thirty thousand dollars a year for sort of a typical public company board. Uh, for the people who are generally uh, given these positions, that's not actually a lot of money. So, so it's not really a financial, um, a financial motivation. More likely, it's, they care about their reputation. These are prestigious positions. Uh, they are, it gives them a, a chance to um, sort of, not socialize, but, but 
spend time uh, with uh, people who are also of, uh, of, of high stature and, and interested in similar things. And in some cases, they may view this as a public service, right? as a way of contributing their, their knowledge and skills to another organization. Okay. And then you've got the managers. The managers at this bottom level are the people who show up to work nine to five uh, every day at this company. Okay. These are the people, the directors delegates to them. Uh, here's our broad strategic direction. Now carry it out and report back. Right? And then the managers show up. They uh, run the, uh, the company. They make every day-to-day -day decision. They might hire and fire the employees of the company. Um, and they're motivated, typically, by their own self-interest. You know, this is uh, something that we would normally assume uh, for thinking you know, in an economic sense. People generally act in their own self-interest. And their interests are um, low risk. They don't want to lose their jobs. They're making a big personal investment in this, in this corporation. Um, so they, they, they don't want much risk. They prefer generally to um, fly business class rather than uh, economy. They would rather have a big office rather than a small office. So there's a certain amount of what we think of as like gold plating. right? They prefer perks as opposed to no perks. Um, and they also prefer uh, empire building. Right? These are the CEO of a company. It's generally more prestigious and more meaningful for that person to be the CEO of a really big company as compared to the CEO of sort of a moderately sized company. So there's a tendency um, to prefer growth right? for the people who are running, uh, running corporations. And, and this, can, be, uh, this can, off, can sometimes lead to sort of uh, inappropriate business decisions. Okay? So, and this is a problem because the managers are really investing the money of the shareholders, right? If we follow up the chain, we're not seeing like a direct correlation between the motivation of all of these different groups of people. So the legal response to this problem of self-interest on the part of managers um, and the related problem of no supervision uh, is to impose on directors and managers a duty, uh, a, a duty to act in the best interest of the corporation. Okay? And this duty is uh, something that uh, can always be challenged. You know, if, if it's felt that a director or manager is not, not fulfilling this duty, not acting in the best interest of the corporation, then shareholders or sometimes creditors can go to court and, uh, and make that claim that the directors are not fulfilling this duty and get some relief, right? Various kinds of relief from the court. Um, the recourse for the other constituencies, those third parties out there that are affected by the corporation, uh, but not actually uh, a part of the power structure of the corporation, is a lot more limited. Okay? So what can employees do if they're not happy with the way the corporation is being run? You know, if it's being run for the benefit of the managers and not not, not the corporation itself? Or what can the community do? What can the environment, you know, the broader community? What, the, these, if they're being damaged, these constituencies really don't have any legal means of recourse. Okay. And this is why we have regulation in these areas. Okay. So there's a couple more concepts that I just want to mention. Um, and the first is this idea of the corporation as a person. You know, this is something where it's probably very common knowledge. Everybody knows that the corpora uh, corporation is a person. But what does that actually mean? You know, and, and, and why has this developed, right? Um, it's this kind of, this, this personality, you know, is really kind of a legal shorthand, right, for, um, for some of the characteristics that we commonly uh, attribute to, to human beings. Okay, legal, the legal powers that we attribute to human beings. So first of all, is the ability to own property. This is a really key um, uh, characteristic. The ability to enter into contracts. Okay? The ability or the, to have its own rights and its own liabilities. Um, the right to sue and be sued. This is essential to, to, to being able to have any rights or, li or be able to enter into contracts. It's meaningless if you don't have the ability to actually access the legal system to enforce them. 
and perpetual existence until, at least until dissolved. You know, corporations can, of course, cease to exist, but until they are dissolved, they, they continue to exist. They're not tied to a specific human life. Okay? An individual shareholder can die, the corporation keeps going. All of the shareholders could die, the corporation keeps going. Right? And so these are, these are really the inherent characteristics that a person has uh, in our legal system uh, that a human person has that also are shared by a corporation. There are some differences, okay? um, specifically some of the constitutional rights that human beings have uh, are not necessarily shared by corporations. So, so you know, corporations are, are, are people to a certain extent. They're people in our legal system to the extent necessary. Um, uh, having said that they don't have all constitutional rights, they, they do have some constitutional rights. It generally depends on the nature of the right and whether it's, whether it's for want of a better word, whether it's necessary for a corporation to have this particular right or not. Sorry? Uh, okay, for instance, um, corporations have been found to have uh, a right to be free from unreasonable search and seizure. So the police can't just storm into a corporation's offices and, and grab whatever they want. Right? Uh, people also, of course, have that right. Uh, but people, for example, have the right to, be, to have security of the person, right? to not be physically um, threatened you know, by, uh, by police or other government actors. And corporations don't have that same right. You know? so, so it really depends on whether it's something that actually you know, makes sense. For, for, for given the fact that the, of what a corporation is. Um, so there are situations also where a corporate personality is disregarded by the courts. Okay? Um, and sometimes the people behind the corporation are actually found to be liable for what the corporation has done. Right? And that's the, 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 the situations where that might occur is where there's a fraud. You know, the people have created the corporation and gone about used it for the purposes of carrying on a fraud. In that case, the court will just say, yes, there's the corporation that has a personality, it's a separate legal entity and everything, but we're just going to ignore that because you have used this to, create, to perpetrate a fraud on another person. Uh, in the case of torts, uh, certain torts, that's where somebody has been injured, um, either economically or physically, by the activities of a corporation, depending on who the human actor actually is, who, who, uh, who perpetrated the tort, uh, the corporate personality can be ignored. In some cases of a corporation being very, very minimally financed and then taking on extremely risky, uh, extremely high liability activities, um, that's in some situations, the courts have disregarded the corporate entity and, and found the human people behind it to be liable. Or in some cases where it's a public policy issue, you know, um, or where there's been non-arm's length transactions where you could really, sort of similar to the, the idea of fraud, but where economically there's no distinguishing between, between the human person and the corporation. And as I said, we have, do have this tendency to anthropomorphize corporations, but having, having gone through that description now uh, of the legal uh, characteristics of a corporation, you know, hopefully that casts a little bit more uh, context in terms of whether we think that a corporation can really be greedy or sociopathic or, you know, have other human characteristics the way that some commentators would suggest. You know? um, really what we have is a constellation of human actors, right? Each with their own series set of <clears throat> motivations and, and, and <coughs> Excuse me, and characteristics. <clears throat> Does attributing these kind of characteristics to a corporation actually help our understanding? Right? Is it helpful for us? Does it help us develop policy to to sort of uh, think of corporations as sort of inherently uh, inherently evil, or inherently corrupt, inherently greedy? You know, it, I'm not sure that it. I'm not sure that it really is clarifying. You know, and in fact, I think really can obscure 
uh, the true nature of the relationship that's going on within a corporation. A related idea is this idea of punishment of a corporation. And this comes up a lot, especially where a corporation has been involved in some really egregious wrong. You know, it's an oil spill, right? Or um, some terribly pol polluting activity or some activity that completely disregards the well-being of, uh, of, of a number of uh, human beings or <clears throat> I'm sure you can think of any number of, of horrible wrongdoings that a corporation could be implicated in. And when that happens, there's always, let's take the oil spill example, there's always the reality that in the legal system, w, the corporation will be forced to pay for whatever damage has occurred. <clears throat> and there's really no, not much dispute about the appropriateness of that or that that, that should occur. But Invariably, there'll be further calls. So yes, they have to, BP has to pay for the, you know, all of the damage that's occurred in the Gulf, or BP and whoever else might be responsible. But, um, but what about further punishment? You know? No, do they have to really pay? The Exxon Valdez, another great example about punishment of the corporation. You know? There's certainly very loud uh, calls for um, for additional penalties to be imposed. Right? And it's worth thinking about when we, when we look at the corporation as the constellation of human actors and human investors, you know, who would really be harmed? You know? Would the corporation really feel bad that it was charged an extra $10 billion? You know, would it feel, would it learn its lesson? <laughs> I mean, these are things that we would, we would certainly say if there was a human being, you know, that there has to be like a really substantially negative penalty, you know, an extra negative penalty um, in order to have the, the, the effect that we would want, you know, a punishing effect. But in reality, when we're talking about a corporation, uh, of course the corporation can't be locked up or thrown in jail uh, because it doesn't have a, a physical presence. But if it's ordered to pay money, this money is going to come from the pockets of the shareholders. Okay? The corporation will have lower profits, cannot pay out its profits and dividends to its shareholders. Uh, so uh, the money will essentially come from the shareholders. Some of it may be passed on to its customers uh, who are purchases its services, depending on whether the market will bear uh, an increase in price. Um, so, so you have this, uh, this cost of punishment being passed on to what is in most cases 70% pension funds and mutual funds. Okay? Basically widely dispersed amongst all of the people who have, who have savings invested in, in public equities. Okay? So certainly something to, be, to keep in mind. Um, I'll just say a few, you know, we've got a couple more minutes and then I'll, we'll open it up to sort of discussion or, or questions. There's been a, quite a few proposals made, you know, about, uh, and there's quite a few people uh, who actively uh, think very hard about, uh, about some of the problems and challenges posed by corporations in our society uh, or in our world more, more generally, and, uh, and, and have done a lot of thinking about that. And, and some of the proposals are, are probably um, more realistic than others. And maybe we can, maybe I can just throw these out there and we can discuss them uh, discuss them sort of in a, in a sort of more informal way. Uh, corporate social responsibility, you know, and demanding um, uh, that companies sort of specifically think and engage in, in, in uh, corporate social responsibility activities are certainly very important um, uh, modern uh, uh, development. You know, this is something that is more likely to be effective in changing corporate behavior for companies that actually sell something to the public, you know, a uh, lot of companies are not involved in that kind of activity. Um, so, so it has some limited effectiveness. Uh, regulation, you know, certainly been uh, used to great effect in the in areas like uh, environmental degradation, labor standards, uh, you know, uh, all of the uh, sort of a number of the sort of capitalist market failures that I mentioned. These are things that have been that have been that have been widely regulated, and 
you know, a lot of the worst things that were uh, going on sort of 100 years ago sort of no longer take place. Um, other calls have related to changes to the legal nature of the corporation itself. Okay? And, and these are various, uh, but are, are generally problematic, you know, because the corporation has, uh, has developed over time to be actually pretty good at um, at what it does, which is allow for passive investment, large accumulations of capital, uh, and, uh, and, and, and to, promote, uh, to promote economic investment. Um, other suggestions include uh, uh, basically killing a corporation if it does something that's really, really bad. Uh, so revoking its charter, you know, for example, sort of causing it to cease to exist. Right? The, the, the capital punishment of, uh, of, of, corporate, uh, of, of corporate law. This is a bit of a problem because, again, it, it kind of anthropomorphizes the corporation. Like, in reality, if a corporation like, let's say, BP, were punished by, by having it cease to exist, it would sell all of its assets to other corporations. Uh, it would distribute that money out to its shareholders. And its shareholders would take that money and invest probably in the other corporations that bought the assets that BP had. You know, so so it's not the existence of a particular corporation that is really um, the problem necessarily. Um, another would be to exclude or somehow expel unwanted corporations from certain activities. This is something that actually might be workable if, for example, uh, a corporation was prohibited from engaging in, in certain market sectors because of past bad behavior, um, that would definitely have a, a negative effect on it. It would cause its investors to you know, maybe go and invest in other corporations uh, that, uh, that did do, uh, that did engage in the particular activity. So that might actually have the effect of sort of channeling, channeling behavior. Um, taking away limited liability is one you hear quite a bit. Uh, where the idea is to make directors or managers or even shareholders uh, liable for either for all of the activities of the corporation, that's usually a bit extreme, or for certain really, really bad things. Um, uh, again, defining that or making investment risky for people is, is a problem. It'll inhibit, it'll inhibit investment. Um, eliminating the idea of uh, corporate personality, you know, I'm not sure. I think this is, for the most part, um, um, sort of a, not a very well-informed suggestion, mainly because, you know, what are you going to take away? The ability to own property, you know, the ability to be sued and be sued. I mean, these are these are critical uh, uh, things for a corporate existence, right? They're they're sort of they can't really be. Extracted. I mean, it, that would just mean not having corporations anymore, really, um, or putting a stop to constitutional claims. Depending on the nature of the constitutional claim, and of course, in different countries, there's different types of constitutional claim. You know, that might have some. There may be some constitutional claims that are, that are, you know, that wouldn't have any real significant consequence if corporations weren't allowed to make them. So, um, so that that's a possibility. Um, removing corporations from politics and from political lobbying. This is. Particularly, you hear this much more so in the U.S. context, and uh, and probably a very uh, useful suggestion. Uh, and reform of corporate lobbying, a related suggestion, you know, to say, well, you know, we need to to sort of consider what's going on in our political process, you know, and how corporations are, uh, because they're unlike regular people, unlike regular citizens of the country, they have vast resources at their disposal, and they're able to to. Uh, they're able to apply leverage to, to governments in terms of their ability to create jobs and so on. Right? So, so there does, I, I think, perhaps need to be some focus on, on this particular area. Um, and you can probably think of others. And so with that, maybe I'll just uh, stop talking for a while and, and, uh, and open the floor up to, to any suggestions that you have, or maybe you totally disagree with something that I've, that I've said. And, um, does anyone have any comments or any questions? <laughs>